My name is Paul Shelley and welcome to Galactic Historian and welcome to another system survey. This is a sub-series where I look at specific systems and planets in sci-fi universes and discuss their impact on lore. This system survey is on a system near and dear to my heart and likely one of the first we will get into the game, Magnus. Before we get started, I want to personally thank y'all for your continued support. Every video is starting to take off more and more, and the growth of the channel has been awesome to watch. If this is your second time enjoying one of these videos, then that should mean you're enjoying the content. If so, then hit that subscribe button. If this is more than your second, then you really should hit that bell to get updates the moment these drop. I'd like to also apologize for my voice. I know the quality is going to drop a little bit. I'm just getting over about with Corona. With that all being said, let's take a look at the system of Magnus. Magnus is one of the oldest systems of humanity. First discovered in 2499, it was an undistinguished system. Three planets orbiting a Type K main sequence star, with only a single jump point to the Ellis system known at its discovery. Eventually, two other jump points would lead to Terra in 2516 and Stanton in 2851. Magnus 1 is a Chthonian planet a gas giant that has its outer layer stripped away due to its proximity to the star. The remaining planet is the dense metallic core of the former gas giant, packed with valuable materials and metals, which are difficult to extract from the hardened crust. Magnus II is the only terrestrial world in the system, and is the only one in the green zone, however, just on the edge. So even when the planet was terraformed, it was a hard planet to live on. It's mostly desert, with the most habitable locations being near the poles, where the climate is more temperate. Lastly, Magnus III is what is known as a Super Jupiter, a large, multicolored gas giant situated on the outskirts of the system. It's likely that its density makes any attempt at mining the gas of the planet difficult at best. The presence of the dense metals on Magnus I and the, at the time, remoteness of the system attracted the attention of the military, who saw the system as a good place to build ships, far from the public eye to keep their work safe and with a local source of materials to rely on. Then, when Terra was discovered not long after, its connection to one of the most viable systems in human space meant it was even easier to move materials and ships to and from Magnus. So, in 2533, the military began the process of terraforming Magnus II, naming it Berea. The name is likely a clever joke, as Berea means cold wind in Latin, an interesting name for such a hot and dry planet. By the end of the 26th century, the planet had become a large-scale naval base and source of a great deal of ship construction. This would be the main source of work for the planet, as most jobs revolved around the naval shipyards or other companies like the famed parts manufacturer Kruger Intergalactic, who started on Berea as a simple workshop in 2553, but grew as the money started to roll into the system, building everything from firing pins for rifles to complex capital ship components. For 50 years, Berea and Magnus were the center of ship production in the Empire, building ships like the iconic RSI Perseus and much of the war materiel to fight both Tavaran wars. This would cause the main settlements of the planet, Newcastle and Odessa, to grow dramatically, with Newcastle becoming the capital and Odessa becoming the main military shipyard of the Empire. However, by 2631, the military experienced budget cutbacks and started to scale back production there. Because of the nature of the system, the military did not allow many non-military related businesses and people to settle down. So as the UEE moved its main ship operations away from Magnus to systems like Killian, the money and people began to leave the system with them. But these were not allowed to be replaced with new investors or settlers. Between 2631 and 2751, when the military officially shut down the naval yards on the system, Reports say that the population shrank to under 30,000 people, leaving most settlements as ghost towns, and row upon row of empty factories, warehouses, and docks. The struggling workers of the system received even more blows, when around the same time, Lane Corpos, a distant cousin of Ulysses Meser, was placed in charge of the system. He made conditions even worse by forcing children as young as seven to work 14-hour shifts 
every day in the weapons factories of the planet. When 12-year-old Anthony Tanaka was forced to work another shift on top of a 16-hour shift he had just completed, he snapped and began shouting at his supervisor. One of Corpo's advocacy agents shot the child dead on the factory floor for his defiance. This footage would be leaked all over the Empire and further drive home the bleak future of the entire UEE, especially the dying Magnus. However, it also galvanized the population to resist Mezzer rule. Tanaka became a martyr for the cause of liberty against the Mezzer tyranny, the first shot in the future revolution sparked by Magnus. Once the military legally abandoned the system, there was the beginning of a new life for Magnus. As it was no longer officially military controlled, new settlers were allowed to stake new claims. It was this time when the system earned its famous slogan, on the edge of the unknown. These new settlers were very different from the engineers and workers who had built the mighty UPE and then UEE fleets of the past. They were rougher, wilder, and had a more frontier sensibility. The system quickly became a place known as a wild, anything goes, kill or be killed attitude with a frontier code of honor, a new wild west where fortunes could be made or lost with the right gun. Unfortunately, this change in culture was the beginning of the end for Kruger, who, despite proudly declaring they were staying when the military left and even stamped Made in Magnus on all of their parts, began to lose shipments to pirate raids. The final straw came in 2785, when a raid on a convoy of essential parts for RSI nearly lost them their lucrative long-term contract with them. By 2789, the homegrown company that had defined the system for hundreds of years officially moved to the Castra system. However, this new lawless frontier wasn't always a bad thing for new companies. Using this change of culture as a cover, the UEE hired an ex aegis engineer, Juliet Maupin, and her team to develop new weapons as a last-ditch effort by the failing Mezzer Empire to maintain control. In a nondescript building in Newcastle, they worked and created a new Gatling gun and mass driver, which were soon sent off to be tested in Killian, on the same day as the massacre of Garen II was broadcast to the verse, and the anti mezer revolution began. These weapons would eventually become the blueprints for Apocalypse Arms, proving that even after the military and Kruger had fled the system, weapons that changed the face of war were still being made in Magnus. Soon, the frontier culture began to solidify, becoming a place where you were as likely to be stabbed as welcomed, but it also became a place where it was believed anyone could get a fresh start. The land was cheap, facilities and storage abundant, and a growing population looking to make it. It also attracted more and more criminals, outlaws, and pirates seeking the same wealth and opportunity. After the fall of the Mezzers in the late 28th century, Magnus was growing but seen as a very dangerous location. That is, until a small startup sought to take advantage of the old UEE Navy shipyards, which were going for a bargain. This startup had been created in the mid 29th century by Jan Dredge for a UEE competition to create a frontier fighter known as the Volksfighter Competition. Their entry, the Cutlass lost out to the now forgotten Wildcat, but the team believed their rugged, dependable design had a place in the civilian market. The shipyards of Odessa proved the right price and the system the right attitude for this new company. The newly created Drake Interplanetary would open shop in the system in 2845 and has been there ever since. If Kruger represented the old Magnus, Drake was the new Magnus. They wholeheartedly embraced the outlaw culture of the system, and the system embraced them back. Soon, Drake's fortunes rose as the ships became staples in the UEE. With every new Drake ship being built, new opportunities and money flowed into the system. So as Drake rose, so did Magnus, a trend that continues to this very day. However, for all of this good news, there was still some bad news. Not all of the system had been turned over. 
Magnus I is still under the control of the UEE Navy, who refuses to give up their rights to the metal and mineral rich planet. This is a point of contention with the local government, who want to use the wealth of the planet to speed up their economic recovery. Though, for some reason, the Navy continues to refuse mining rights to the system they abandoned almost two centuries ago. The planet itself is recovering, but much of the dusty world is either too dangerous to live or filled with ghost towns. These echoes of the planet's first life were abandoned when the Navy pulled out. Much of what is left has been left to decay, as newer settlers generally steer clear of these old ruins, preferring to set up their own habs and businesses. As for the cities, an accident has caused Newcastle's spaceport to be shut down, so the primary landing zone today is Odessa. With it being the only port of call for the system, it is more sparse than many may be used to, without a ton of amenities, but plenty of local color. While these cities are improving, they still have a significant gang problem, which has stifled growth. Many abandoned buildings have been claimed by squatters, but many of these places have also become mom-and-pop industrial shops, selling everything from legal to questionable materials. Magnus is a system that has lived two lives, a naval shipyard and a frontier boomtown. Its slow return to its former height is a painful one, but one the locals are willing to deal with. Because when everything is all said and done, nothing has been able to kill the system or her people. Not economic collapse, not brutal tyranny, not revolution, not waves of outlaws. It's proved to be one tough system to crack, one not afraid to buck tradition, and one the people love to call home. That was the history and lore of Magnus. I hope you enjoyed our look at this fascinating old frontier system. If you did, remember to tap that like button and tell your friends in order to spread the word. I'd also like to thank these Patreons on screen now for helping me make this all possible. If you want to join them, the link is in the description. For as little as $5 a month, you can get early access to videos, including a timed exclusive covering the entire history of the Star Citizen universe, whose first episode has recently been released to the public. Check it out now and see what $5 a month will get you. For now, let me know what system you want me to cover next in the comments below. And as always, remember, Exhistoria at Astra.